Hey everyone, I'm Shobhik. With me, I have got Adam Kaplan. Um, we are software engineers at Red Hat, and we'll be talking about our journey on building container images on Kubernetes. Um, so, a quick introduction into who we are. Uh, I, I, I work as an architect in the CI, CD, and GitOps space at Red Hat. Um, and Adam works as the OpenShift Build API team lead at Red Hat. So we've got good experience here between doing CI and doing builds the old way and the new way. So a quick history, a quick note on what we'll discuss today. We'll be you know, going down the history to about building apps in general and then building images eventually after that. We'll do a small case study of our experience with OpenShift Build so far. And from there, we'll jump into why we have Project Shipwright. Um, which is the next step after OpenShift Build, which has been quite successful. So, if 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 I if I may quickly, um, you know, go over the old school way of doing things. So the old school way of doing things was typically you have a local dev environment where you have some Java code, um, and then you build a jar out of it, and then you deploy it on a VM, and after that, you're good. It's a it's a nice CI system, all works. Um, and then what you decide, hey, this worked on my CI system, which tried out this jar on a VM. Now let's deploy it on test stage prod, uh, which could be another VM. So it's effectively the journey from your Java file that got turned into a jar somehow using a Jenkins maybe. And then you deploy it in a couple of different environments on VMs um, to actually finish your cycle. That was how the old school used to be. Um, and Adam, at any point, if you're joining, just raise your hand and let me know, and we can get started. Um, but then we have the new school here, which means uh, things are probably robust in a lot of different ways, but at the same time, that added to a bunch of complexities. Um, so you do have the same Java code, which needs to be turned into a jar eventually, but you don't typically do it do a deploy on Kubernetes the same way you used to do on a VM, which means you don't take a jar and deploy it in Kubernetes directly. Um, there are things that have to happen with it before you can actually deploy your jar on Kubernetes, which means you have to build an image out of it. Um, you have to ensure it adheres to certain security constraints so that it can actually go and de be deployed in Kubernetes without becoming a nightmare for your admin. Um, so this is definitely different than what you saw in old school, where you could simply take a jar, give it to your ops or DevOps person, and you're on your way. Now, well, in this new school, the th most important thing is effectively container images, um, which means eventually what you want to deploy on your test stage prod is not a jar file, does not see a jar file, what it sees is a container image that your application has been built into. So how you get there? Well, there are a number of ways to get there, of course. So if I have my Java code on my laptop, it has to be committed to Git, for example, and then something has to turn it into an image. Um, it could be you yourself who build an image out of it and push to registry and then attempt at deploying on Kubernetes. Um, but a more conventional way to do so would be have a CI system that takes care of your code, builds an image out of it, and then deploys it. Um, a key component of the CI system would be the stuff that builds images out of it, which means you need something in your system where you would say, hey, I've got my source code here. I need to build an image out of it. And then I want to deploy it on Kubernetes. Now, your CI system could be running on a Kubernetes cluster, it may not be running on a Kubernetes cluster. It may be running on a Kubernetes cluster without any awareness of the fact that it is running on Kubernetes, which means um, you may still not have to use any Kubernetes-specific APIs. But then the idea is you need infrastructure where you need to be able to build images. And building images are fairly expensive. So that needs attention in itself. So a quick case study. Um, the main reason we get into this case study is because um, we've tried solving this problem for the last three, four years. Um, a quick history of where we as Red Hat come from in this space, and there have been many other attempts 
but given that we've tried out with OpenShift, but I'd like quickly give a give an overview of how our experience was with this. Um, so we started with so a user would start with a source code called app.java, for example. Um, then we have OpenShift builds on OpenShift today, which is build config. There you would be able to specify your parameters that would tell OpenShift, what do I want to build? How do I want to build? And where do I want to eventually push it to? So you may say, hey, here is my source code. I want to do a Docker build of it, or I want to do a source to image build of it. And then I would want to push it to Quare IO or into an image stream. Both would work. So in this, in, in this experience, the one thing that we learned is building images are expensive. They need a lot of care to ensure that they're secure. And number three, while we started out with, while we were probably one of the first uh, projects to actually provide a robust build experience on a Kubernetes cluster, um, while doing so, there were other tools, there, were, there was other innovation happening in this space with respect to how do you build images securely on Kubernetes. We did end up with a few limitations in there. While, while OpenShift builds have been massively successful, there are, were a couple of limitations where, which namely our, lim our limited tooling, which means we are constrained to using source to image and builder. Uh, we don't expose build as such, but then today in OpenShift builds, when you do a Docker file based build, you're potentially using builder under the hood. And for those who don't know, source to image is a way for you to build images without you having to specify any, anything like a Docker file into your source code. It just takes care of converting a source code into an image um, with a specific framework that we have defined. But then it's still limited to the fact that there are these two options that you have with respect to building images. Of course, it's a closed ecosystem at the, at the moment, um, given the fact that we started probably three, four years back. It's, it, the ecosystem hasn't been as open as it could be. Uh, of course, it's inflexible, which is one of the key concerns we wanted to address in the upcoming slides that we'll be talking about, which means if I had to add another way of building images, it is definitely possible today, but it's not super easy to do for an admin or for a user. And of course, it works in OpenShift only, given the fact that the API itself conforms to Kubernetes standards. Um, you know, we would want to now take this to the next level of ensuring that we not only build something for OpenShift, we build something for Kubernetes that we also may happen to use that that we also will be using for OpenShift, but it has to be built in a way that any Kubernetes would be able to use it, be it OpenShift or be it a non-OpenShift Kubernetes. So while we were doing that, we figured out that, hey, we started, we started with you know, solving this problem of building images on Kubernetes because you need to eventually deploy images on Kubernetes as we saw the old school and the new school. Um, we did solve the problem to a great extent. It works. But now we see in the community there is a lot of innovation happening around strategies of building images from source code. And we didn't want to ignore it at all. We wanted to embrace it. And we wanted to start a project around it to ensure that if a user or if an admin has an opinion on what the best way to build images are, on Kubernetes, one should not be constrained on what they could use. For example, if, if, a, if a Kubernetes admin decides that, hey, um, I love cloud native buildbacks, um, they should have a Kubernetes API to be able to use it. Uh, the same goes for a builder or source to image or Docker file build. The idea is we should provide an API for admins and users to be able to build images in OpenShift with well-known strategies. Or if an admin wants to define their own image build strategy, they should be able to do so. And we want to help build out the contract, which is vendor neutral, um, which doesn't think about any first class strategy out of the box. Rather, what it says, hey, if your strategy is something that can be defined, um, we want to embrace it. We want to ensure you're able to run that on Kubernetes. So with that, uh, we would want to introduce Project Shiprite. 
it's a framework for building container images on Kubernetes, which means it doesn't specify any first class citizen about which can build strategy you should be using. If you want to come and say, hey, I have invented my new build strategy, excellent. We would provide a Kubernetes framework and an API for you to be able to run that on Kubernetes. So with Shipwright builds, you should be able to build container images on Kubernetes, um, which means it's a CRD-based project, so you should be able to install it on your cluster via CRD and controllers, and you should be good to go. You could use your tool of your choice. As I mentioned, it could be Builda, S2I, Cloud Native Build Packs, Kaneko. Um, I think one of our colleagues or even have even come up with a build strategy for Co, which is a nice build and release management tool by Google in the KNAD space. Um, you should be able to customize them. As a quick example, if your admin wants to reduce the capabilities that you want to give to your build system because um, your admin isn't too comfortable with a very expanded set of capabilities, you should, the admin should be able to do that um, in a very easy way. It shouldn't be harder than going and modifying a CR and ensuring that the same update is available to all users on your cluster. Um, and one of the most exciting things that it's powered by Tekton API is under the hood. It's a non-leaky abstraction, which means you don't get to interact with Tekton, uh, but under the hood, we are using the popular open source project Tekton to actually do all the heavy network there. A quick look at what the different APIs are in the Shipwright world. So you have a build strategy API. That, that's where you define how you want to get your image built. So the build strategy API would be used by admins to define, hey, I want to offer a Kaneko build strategy on the cluster. I want to offer a build packs build strategy on the cluster. Um, this API is available both in the namespace scope and in the cluster scope, so which means if you want to try something risky, a risky build strategy, you could totally do that in the confines of your namespace. Um, and once you're happy with it, you could just make it a cluster scope CR and you're good. Um, the build is the build API is where you define how your build needs to look like. Um, that's effectively the one on the left of my screen, which is you see that I have defined that I want to build my source code called foo no JSX. Um, here, here are my credentials for my source code. Um, I want to build it using the build packs v3 strategy. Uh, which is a reference to another CR effectively. And I want to send the output of my build, which is an image, to QAIO FUBAR, and here are your credentials for it. It's a pretty straightforward, simple API. Um, the, the goal during the API design phase was to ensure that it should be easy for, and um, even though there's YAML in there, but you should be able to understand, hey, it, it should be a no-brainer to say, here, here's my source code, here is my output, here are my credentials, and this is a strategy I want to use to be able to build it. Yes, and right now we have tried out and hosted a bunch of build strategies on our GitHub repository. Um, we've tried out build, build up, build packs, Kaneko source to image, and we're really looking forward to you contributing more. The goal is uh, we would love to maintain uh, popular build strategies in the upstream community, um, which means the list is definitely not exhausted the way you see here. We would want to see more build strategies being contributed such that they are available for consumption on a Kubernetes cluster. With that, I jump into a demo to show you that things are actually working. Right, so, I, so I'm on an OpenShift cluster right now, and to be clear, this is because I had an OpenShift cluster around. You could do the same thing on Kubernetes, on plain vanilla Kubernetes as well, not the Red Hat distribution of Kubernetes, which is OpenShift. So if I go to my build strategy, I let me this out. So if we go in here, you could see that I've got four CRs here. One is build up, build packs, v3, Kaneko, and source to image. So at this point, the admin has enabled these four build strategies, and they are simple CRs, and we can go in and show you how they look like later on. 
But in general, I think we have these four build strategies available on the cluster. If you can see the pre divers from a vendor as well as mechanism of building images perspective, I'm going to go and do a build. So let's say, let me grab some YAML. And how's a demo? A demo if we don't show you YAML. Right, so I think there are a few things to note here that I am in my, let me get into my namespace. Or I may actually not go from here just so that I can. I'm going to actually open up a new, create a new CRD instance, create a new CR. So I'm going to name this as my node app. Um, this builds from a Docker file, this one specifically. And just let me just give you a nice image tag. I'm, I'm going to push it. So I'm going to build the main branch of this GitHub repository. Awesome. So I'm executing a build using Builder. Um, as a quick wrap, what we just did is we told you that we have got some cluster build strategies on the cluster. Uh, we defined a build, which means we created a build definition to say, hey, this is what we're going to build. This is where we're going to push to. And this is how we're going to build it. With. Um, and then we decided to execute a build. So with that, I could quickly show you what's happening out there. You can see there's a new build pod being initialized. Uh, nothing too exciting here other than the fact that, yes, it's going to take, make a lot of things boring for you because it's going to take care of building the image for you and pushing it to query.io in the most boring way possible so that you don't have to think about what happens behind the scenes when an image is being built because Shipwright is taking care of that for you. So while that's happening, um, Adam, now that you're here, I think we missed you on a couple of things. So, so we were discussing on the old school and the new schools. And while discussing about that, I wanted to pick your brain on the fact that you did get an early head start on the new school Kubernetes, even before you joined Red Hat. Yes. So how was that experience like while the build happened? So, well, that was like a very challenging time uh, when I was uh, I was working at a startup, and we, like many startups, this was back in I think what 2014, 2015. Uh, we had our application on Amazon. We were using EC2 instances, uh, effectively virtual machines on Amazon's infrastructure, and uh, we found that it was harder for us to kind of scale there. And we thought Kubernetes would be a better way to, to do things and would help not only our company scale as we grew, but also it would help us as developers get our applications into production. And uh, we had to dive in to the complete ecosystem in order to like really get it there. We had to learn Docker. We had to learn how to write a Docker file. We had to uh, really inspect the intricacies uh, of our application um, because Kubernetes forces you to think about things that you probably didn't have. Sometimes you might overlook. Um, for example, uh, memory allocation, um, how much memory our applications were using. Um, it took us about six months for us to get from starting to write our container images and push our application to production uh, to actually get it there and running uh, in a stable capacity in production because we would consistently find that uh, when we're trying to tune things that um, one part of our application wouldn't talk to another part or uh, we thought we were giving things enough memory, but if a user interacted with the application in a certain way, memory would explode. And then uh, in on our EC2 instance, we might have been covered by the fact that we had large memory and it kind of hid the fact that we were spiking. But on Kubernetes, if we didn't set uh, sufficient memory limits, then the pod would crash. Uh, it would get an out of memory error, and then uh, the user would be left hanging. So right. even when we got to it into production and working and we got everything talking to each other, uh, we would still continually run into issues where some things just would not 
uh, would crash because of the things that Kubernetes makes you think about. Right. So building an image locally and trying to deploy it wouldn't necessarily work on Kubernetes. Right? Yeah, yeah, that was uh, another challenge. You know, certainly uh, the the days of we were had a Python application, so in some sense, like our we had nothing to compile. It was just uh, our Python scripts. But right. at the same time, assembling it into an image uh, meant uh, codifying all the things that we had uh, on our servers. And uh, we found sometimes that uh, some virtual machines were configured one way, some were configured a different way. And so there was uh, a big challenge kind of bringing those things together uh, such right. that um, all the different things like cron jobs, for example, um, you know, if you just have an EC2 instance, you can say, okay, this one EC2 instance has uh, the cron jobs that take care of various batch things. Well, on Kubernetes, you need that in a container image, and then you have to create a cron job object for you to do that. So, right, those are one of the many many challenges that we had in writing the Docker file so that we had everything there. Um, it, it exposed things that frankly, uh, might have been missed, especially as, you know, as a younger company, we still had a bit of turnover and things that were done that uh, weren't necessarily documented. So it revealed right. a lot to us. That it's definitely not a boring way to deal with deploying applications. There was a lot of involvement by various folks into ensuring that you would actually take your source code and get it deployed on Kubernetes. Yes. Right. Thank you for that. Hey, I think, yeah. My pleasure. Yeah, I, I think I think with that, I did do a walkthrough on how things were on OpenShift builds, how things are on OpenShift builds, and you know, why we're on Searship, right? So uh, I think with that, um, it quickly jump into the build that succeeded here. So, hey. yeah. so if you see here, we built an image and I'm going to deploy it shortly, but first I'm going to show you that we can actually build it using different strategies. So I built my Node app build using um, the builder strategy. I should have named it properly, but okay. I built it using the builder strategy and the build succeeded. Now I'm going to build using a different strategy that's also named with B that's called build packs on OpenShift or Kubernetes. So I'm going to do something very simple, which is I'm going to go here and modify the image bridges, the, the image tag here. And I'm going to say, hey, um, you know, let's do the same build with a build pack v3 strategy. Um, and as you know that you wouldn't need a Docker file for this, I comment it out for now. You don't need a Docker file for doing a build packs build. Um, so everything else remains the same. You specify your output, you specify your credentials to talk to the external registry, you specify an image that you want to push to, um, you specify your source, your revision, and then you have a strategy, which is build pipe v3. With that, I'm going to quickly do a save, and that's done. Now I'm going to go and create a build run out of this, which means I'm going to create an instance of build execution right here. So as you remember, the name of my build definition was my node app. Uh, I'm going to call this build packs build as a generate name. I let it come up with its own name. And there you go. I'm going to say create and let's see whether it gets off. It says pending. Pending is usually good, which means it's trying to pull images. So. You go and hope yeah. folks uh, watching this uh, uh, know or are aware of what uh, build packs are. Uh, this is a, a build using cloud native build packs, it's a project that lets you uh, create a container image just with your code. Uh, it doesn't you don't need to know the intricacies of Docker or how to write a Docker file uh, to get a container image that you can then deploy to production. Um, it's a very cool project. Uh, I think it's buildpacks.io. And uh, there are a lot of different uh, companies that are providing uh, build packs uh, where they can detect uh, which kind of application that you're running 
and based on that can then uh, provide their sort of the right opinionated set of instructions to get your code to production. Right. Yeah, and, and if you were aware of some of the different, and I'm gonna bring in uh, an old build strategy at Red Hat that we were all popular, that we're all well aware of, the source to image, just in, the, it's kind of similar to that, which is you have source code, which turns into an image, um, but they're, like I said, they're different strategies. They, they handle building images in a very different way. And this project ensures that you could use all of those, be it source to image, be it build packs, or be it build up. And while we were talking, the build pack build completed. I'm going to quickly see if it shows up on my tags here. You can see the demo build packs tag has shown up here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick deploy of this container image to see if it actually works. I just hope it works, fingers crossed. I'm going to do a few things here, which is I'm going to say this is, sorry. Sorry, a bit of copy paste out here. All good, and I'm going to say this is a Node.js application, and that's it. So let's see if this gets deployed, and after it gets deployed, you should see a URL serving the contents of the source code. Sorry, the URL containing, the URL serving what the source code is supposed to do. So with that, um, while this is deploying, I'm going to quickly show you another build strategy, and this is important because as promised, this is not just going to be one or two build strategies. We've tried out a few of them, and I'm, I'm going to quickly show you the Kaniko build strategy. Um, so we have the Kaniko build strategy on the cluster, so we are good with that. And we'll do the same thing what we did there. We'll do the same exercise. We'll go and say, hey, let's use a Kaniko one for this. And we'll, we're going to call it Kaniko demo the image that is, that is going to be pushed. And let's build the same source code with a third build strategy out here. All right, let's do it. Yeah. I'm going to create a build run, which is an instance of a build execution of your definition. And as we know, it's called my node app. Let's do Kaniko build. I don't like generating names here. So Adam, you might have noticed you missed something while that, and this is probably going to fail and fine, which is um, Kaniko build needs you to have your Docker file defined. Oh, right? yeah. So let's go and put that in there. And well, let's say you want to get rid of a build execution that you know is not going to work. Let me just quickly go and delete this, it's gonna fail shortly. You know, say, hey, don't bother, we're gonna start a new build with the modified build definition, it's that easy. And I just wanna call out that uh, because this is all API driven, um, there's, some might be asking, is there an easier way for us to do this? Do I have to go in and edit YAML? Uh, and the truth of the matter is that uh, in the future, hopefully you won't. We One of the things that we are working on in Shipwright uh, is a command line interface that we're gonna call SHIP, S-H-P. And that will uh, let you uh, create uh, the build runs from your build objects. Uh, it will, uh, we have on the roadmap to add the ability to cancel a build run while it is executing. So then uh, right. as when you say cancel my build, uh, we will, uh, take care of gracefully terminating that build, make sure uh, that it cleans itself up easily. And uh, other things like adding logs, uh, getting logs out of your builds is also uh, on that roadmap. Right, and there are actually a couple of projects which have started building tooling on top of these APIs, which means if you want to build tooling, like your own CLI, your own UI on top of this for your own distribution of Kubernetes, you're free to do so. Um, we're providing the APIs uh, anyway, for you to be able to create your own experiences. So yeah, I think the image we just built 
um, using build packs on Kubernetes with Shipwright has been deployed successfully, and we can see a running application. Awesome. Look at that. So yeah, with that, I'm probably I going to have like five minutes. Five um, minutes. And we've got a question in the Q Q and A. Uh, Eduardo awesome. asks. Uh, Let's go into questions. Yeah. So Eduardo asks, uh, will builds v two enhance support for config change triggers? So, um, right now with Shipwright, uh, we don't have any event driven mechanisms in it, uh, but that is something that we're actively exploring. So. One of the things that I believe, Shubik, you probably mentioned earlier, I may not have been on the on the session, uh, is that Shipwright is built on top of Tecton. And one of the things that uh, we want to take advantage of is Tecton triggers. And that is a more general purpose uh, way of triggering events and in the Tecton universe. And so uh, things like firing a build run after your build object has been changed is something that is certainly uh, being considered. Um, and we uh, are starting to work cl more closely with the Tecton to community to make things like that happen. Do you want to walk through the future course yes. while you're at it? Yes. Um, so we, uh, our young project, uh, we are absolutely looking for new contributors to come and help out. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the command line interface is one of the things that we are working on. And in fact, is bootstrap has already been bootstrapped. Uh, we, as Shubik was showing you, uh, you can install via uh, operator hub on OpenShift right now. Uh, we have uh, more enhancements coming to that, um, as well as uh, the community also is looking to add uh, the Helm chart option uh, for installation. Uh, we have a pretty bare documentation website. Uh, we would love to have folks uh, contribute to that, uh, especially if you have graphic design skills, web design skills, or uh, if you have any technical writing skills, uh, we would love to have you join us. Uh, and finally, as I alluded to earlier uh, with the Q&A, is that event-driven builds is something that uh, we are looking to, uh, such as config change. Uh, also, uh, some ideas that we have informally discussed is uh, driving builds based off of changes to a base image, uh, which is something that exists in OpenShift. Uh, we don't have that uh, either in Shipwright or Tecton just yet, uh, or even some more, uh, more customized uh, more open means of firing firing off a build. Right, and I think if I could add a more general statement to that, it's like every awesome feature of OpenShift builds that you've loved using in OpenShift, that would be upstreamed in a different way or in the same way in Shipwright IO build, and, in, and we'll ensure that runs on Kubernetes, of course, as a first-class first class thing. Yes. 